Our next speaker today is Dr. Mark Courtney. He's a professor in the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago, and he's an affiliated scholar at Chapin Hall. He was founding director of the award-winning Partners for Children. This is a public-private partnership developed to improving child welfare services. Recently, he received the Distinguished Career Achievement Award from the Society for Social Work and Research. He was named a fellow of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare and received the Leadership Award from the National Association of Public Child Welfare Administrators. And you, some of you may recognize him. He was previously a professor here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Now, he began his career working directly with foster youth in a group home. And when foster youth reached their 18th birthday, he tells me that it was kind of bittersweet. He was happy for the youth because leaving foster care uh, is an important rite of passage into adulthood. But he said it was also sad because they had to give up their bed so another youth could move in, and often they didn't have a place to go. So this bittersweet experience was the beginning of an award-winning career of research into what happens to foster youth between the ages of 18 and 21. His talk today is do the benefits of extending foster care at age 21 outweigh the costs? And he has evidence from Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Thank you very much for coming, Dr. Courtney. Uh, thanks, Karen. Good morning. It's always nice to be back in my old stomping grounds, one of my favorite buildings in the world here. Um, so this, I'm, I'm going to take a while to get to this, this uh, answer here, but uh, this is the topic of discussion today. Do the benefits of allowing young people to remain in care until 21 outweigh the costs? Uh, and we're fortunate enough to have uh, information from this state and, and uh, states next door. So my purpose today is, is to, first of all, provide some context for the transition to adulthood more broadly. I think we want to think as parents, if you like, collective parents of young people in care, what is happening for young adults generally in society? How's that changed? Uh, describe briefly Wisconsin's population of older youth in care, but I'm not really going to do that much because that's already been done, but I'll make a couple of quick comments. I'm going to describe briefly key trends in what most of us would consider, I think, parents would consider uh, transitions to adulthood, and certainly demographers and policymakers are interested in things like education, employment, family formation, etc. I'm going to summarize the research on the benefits of extending care, and really the research on that comes exclusively really from this study that I'm going to talk about. So how does the transition to adulthood look for young people generally in the U.S.? And uh, what, uh, let me first of all make a pitch for a report, recent report by the Institute of Medicine and National Research Council on the health and well-being of young adults. I was on that panel. Um, I think the, to sum up very quickly, a very detailed report. This is a period of great opportunity for young people. It's also a period of great challenge. Uh, opportunities to increase inequality, a lot of unmet health needs. A lot of we, I think that young adults aren't doing nearly as well as we like to think they are. And so if you uh, are interested in this population, I encourage you to look at that report. But we do know a few things. We know that markers of transition to adulthood, so being out on your own, living independently, finishing your education, having children, these things are all happening several years later in the life course into the mid-20s, some cases later, than they were, say, 30 years ago. Um, we know that young people rely heavily on their parents during this period of time. So one statistic I like to throw out there is that half of young people between 18 and 24 in this country are living with one or both of their parents. Um, one quarter of 24-year-olds are living with one or both of their parents. So that's pretty significant support. Uh, we also know that they provide real support, so almost $40,000 in direct support um, between 18 and 34, and other kinds of in-kind support, child care, et cetera. Um, uh, developmental psychologists have come to describe this period as emerging adulthood, when a lot of young people are experimenting with employment, with relationships, with identity. Um, but there's sort of an observation that a lot of marginalized young people who aren't succeeding economically really don't have the luxury of that experimentation. The other thing we know from recent years is developments in neuroscience that say that the, the brain is still developing into your, in mid-20s mid in areas like that are very important to, to making choices and things like that. So I think that, that we recognize now that this is not just 
Uh, you don't make a, a switch and you become an adult, uh, but it's something different than being an adolescent. And yet, the US, U.S. social policy really provides relatively little support to this group. We've made some changes lately. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, for example, says insurance companies must allow young adults to remain on their parents' insurance to 26. We have a similar policy for youth aging out of foster care. But for the most part, we don't distinguish uh, between policy for young adults and all other adults. That's one of the major themes of this uh, National Academies report I mentioned. And the other thing is that we don't pay a whole lot of attention to the so-called other half, the young people who really don't experience this emerging adulthood. They're sort of thrust right out there uh, into the labor market, having to fend for themselves and having a hard time of it. So I'm going to go through this very quickly because most of this has already been stated. But the part I want to point out is that older youth in care are much less likely than younger youth to, to be adopted or to, to go home at some point. Uh, the other thing is that they have family. Most young people aging out of care, I think that the general public, and for understandable reasons, sort of thinks, well, these kids grew up in foster care. No. <laughs> Most of them entered foster care at a later age. In the study I'm going to share with you, the average age at entry to care for youth aging out in this state and the other two states was around 13, which means the vast majority of these young people have family. If you know, three quarters of them are close, are very close to one or more adult members of their family, and yet 90% of them would say, there's nothing you could have done that would allow me to stay in my family. I literally asked that question, because folks in Wisconsin wanted me to ask that question, and 90% of them said, nah, I, you know, I, I, I have a relationship with my family, it was not safe for me to go home, and as far as I'm concerned, there's not a whole lot you could have done about that. So that's sort of the position they're in. Um, and as, as has already been noted, about 377 uh, young people uh, exit this way in, in the most recent year for which there are data. So how do foster youth fare during the transition to adulthood? Um, this is, these are data from what we call the Midwest study. It's a short version of that long title. It's very descriptive, but too long to repeat. Uh, and it, is, it was a study that was a partnership of, led by this child welfare agency. Susan Dreyfus at the time was a child welfare administrator. And following on an earlier study we did here in Wisconsin of youth aging out of care in the mid-90s, uh, she said, we made some changes. Let's see whether they make a difference. And she helped me round up a couple of other states in this region, uh, Illinois and Iowa, to look at how young people aging out of care in those three states were doing. And so these are young people who were still in care at age eight, uh, 17, had been in care for at least a year, had been in care on their 16th birthday, so the states felt some responsibility for helping them with the transition. They were placed because of abuse and neglect, not because of delinquency. Some of them, by the time we, we caught up with them, had involvement with the juvenile court, or the, the juvenile justice side of things, but they had all come into care, not because of their own behavior. Um, and then lastly, we, we've got lots of data on them. What I'm gonna share with you today is, is data from interviews with these young people. And we were able to do interviews at uh, age 17, 19, 21, 24, and 26. Uh, one thing I'll say right now is that if you ask them, they will talk to you. 96% of the young people back at 17 uh, were happy to talk to us. And this is a pretty lengthy interview, about an hour and a half long. And we were able to follow up with about four-fifths of them all the way till they were 26. We have slightly different groups that we catch at each wave. Uh, but we feel this pretty good data on how they did over this period of time. Uh, this gives you a sense of who they are across the three states. They're about half, oh, I goofed up the percentage there, but it's about half male, half female. Uh, a little over half were black, very different between Iowa and Wisconsin. Iowa and Wisconsin is about 70% Caucasian in, in, in these samples. In, in Illinois, it's about 75% African American. So uh, big differences there. And then this gives you a sense of the breakdown between the three states, and this, and this represents uh, actually, this is a, a random sample of young people in Illinois. The number would even be larger if I took the whole eligible population. Uh, but we got all the young people who fit those criteria at the time in Wisconsin and Iowa. So what I'm going to do is, is go quickly through a few indicators of the transition, uh, starting with education. And I'm breaking it out by males and females. As you'll see why in just a minute. What I want to do is focus on a couple of columns here. Well, all three. So th this is a percentage of, of young women who have a high school diploma or GED. You can see by 21, about 80% have that. It moves around here just because of who we're interviewing. You don't really see many of them getting a high school diploma after 21 or a GED. This is a percentage with at least one year of college. And you know it's pretty impressive by age 21, over a third of them have at least one year of college. And, and you can see that they're continuing to get college here. And 
and then you can see that about one in 10 of these young women have a college degree of some sort by the age of 26. These numbers are all lower than in the general population. Uh, in fact, these college numbers are considerably lower in the general population. If you look at young men, the trends are very similar, but you'll notice the columns are a bit lower. Young men are a bit less likely to have a high school diploma or a GED, about half as likely to have a degree. If I restrict my analysis solely to, to non-incarcerated young people, the numbers are almost exactly the same. As you'll see in a moment, the young men are much more likely than young women to be incarcerated. There's a lot of involvement with the adult criminal justice system, and that, that explains a lot of this. I also like to look at enrollment, because it tells a somewhat different story. So we're continuing with education here. And if you look at young women, they're all in, in high school. One thing the child welfare system does, by the way, is it doesn't let you drop out of school, <laughs> which is, is a good thing. Um, and so they're all in school at baseline. Actually, if you looked at this, this group demographically, uh, they would not all be in high school at 17. A lot of them would have dropped out. The child welfare systems don't allow that for the most part. What I want to focus on here is enrolled in college. You can see almost one out of five of these young women are enrolled in college at 26. That's actually you know, higher than in the general population. And so part of the story here that I want to tell is that these young people are having a hard time of it, but they're, they're, they're just behind in many cases, right? You still got 18% of the young women who could get a college degree. They're in college at 26. A uh, bit of a mismatch between our federal policy that provides education and training vouchers to age 23. I suspect Congress thought, well, my kid graduated by 23. Uh, these folks don't all graduate by 23. Uh, but they're still in school, there, so there's some hope there for them to continue to acquire higher ed. Young men, again, the story is more, more disappointing, but nevertheless, one out of 10 young men are in college at age 26. What about employment? This is young men and young women. And basically, uh, you, know, you can see that at any point in time, in general, the young men are slightly less likely than the young women. It varies a bit. Um, at no point do we have more than about half of them employed at the time we interview them. Um, but one thing I want to show is that this trend should go like this. This is the Great Recession. So you know, the impact in the general labor market has been tough. It's been particularly hard for those of you following the news. Uh, the unemployment rate for young adults has just really gone off you know, the map and has stayed very high during this period. Um, Another way to look at this, though, is what percentage of them had a job at some point during the last year. And across these last few waves as young adults, it's about three quarters have a job at some point. So that means one quarter of them, are, when we talk to them, have been unemployed for at least a year. Even among those who are employed, the earnings are about $14,000 a year. That doesn't count the zeros, right? And if we adjust for family size, this means over half of these young people would be categorized as poor in the federal poverty guidelines. What about children? I'm going to focus here on, uh, see how I'm doing here for time? OK. I'm going to focus here on um, how many have living children and then how many are living with those children. So among the young women, you can see that about one in five had a child at baseline. Um, and that by 21, half the young women have a child. So one of the things I like to say in talks like this is, um, We've got 18 states now that have extended foster care to 21, and I, when I get asked to go talk about my research there, I say, so I hope you're all ready to be parents of parents, half the time for the young women, uh, unless you're able to you know, and get, you know, create some really effective pregnancy prevention programs that we haven't found yet. Uh, you know, you, even if you had an impact on that, you still need to be ready to parent young parents. And you know, there, there are a lot of young parents out there um, for this group, parenting young is probably not a great thing. I've got all kinds of research on that, um, but it's important to note. One of the things, though, that I think is, 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 I think, good news is relatively few of these young women have non-resident children. So in other words, they're not having children and they're all going into foster care. That's somebody asked me that. No. The vast majority of these young children are still living with their parents. Uh, with their mother. Some of them have non-resident children. Most of those are living with the other, you know, the other parent or with relatives. But we do have a fair number of them that, that do end up in state care over time. The story for young men is very different. First of all, they're less likely to have children. That's not that surprising. You would see that in the general population. Young, you know, men are older when they, you know, mate, basically. 30% uh, of those young men will be parents, though, by the age of 21. 
But the other thing that's much worse news, I think, and, 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 and something we need to think about, is that two-thirds of the men who have a child are not living with one or more of those children. Now, a lot of the time, those children are living with the other parent, but uh, nevertheless, a lot of young men fathering, quote unquote, using that term loosely here, uh, uh, young children and, and not living with them. And then lastly, criminal justice involvement. Um, that's not a marker of the transition to adulthood that we normally focus on. Demographers, you know, that's kind of an afterthought because it's, except for some populations, African-American males, for example. Um, but what you can see here is a few different things. We've got arrests, convictions, and incarceration rates. And these are, these are since the last time we talked to you. So over here, this is the percentage between 17 and 19, between 19 and 21, et cetera. So this is just, since the last time we talked to you, have you spent a night in jail or prison? And you can see with the young women, it's up to almost one out of five. My eyes are not so good, but I think that's about right. Um, it's, it's declines there at the end. Um, that's much higher than the general population. For young men, though, it's truly disturbing rates of involvement in the criminal justice system. You've got a third to two-fifths of these young men telling us every time we talk to them, yeah, I bet I was in jail at some point. Now, while we talk to them, it, it, we never have more than about 14 percent, still high, but 14 percent of the young men actually in jail at the time. So most of these are short jail stays. A lot of them out here are what we call technical violations. You know, they didn't pay. Uh, the fine, we've been watching, reading the news lately, you don't pay to go to jail, now you're a criminal for not paying. Or you don't pay your court costs, a lot of things. Or you went out of the county or you missed a probation meeting, uh, you, you can end up in jail, right? So most of this is not serious, certainly not violent crime. Um, some of them are drug crimes, property crimes, but nevertheless, it's really high. And a lot of these young people have felony convictions, which means they're ineligible for all kinds of aid, good luck getting a job. Uh, so in summary, great, that's perfect. Uh, in summary, the, the outcomes are relatively poor. Now when I say relatively poor, you can look at this a lot of different ways, but it's certainly relatively poor compared to the general population. Uh, they're relatively poor even if you adjust for basic demographic characteristics. Um, but I'm not, I want to be clear, I'm not attributing these outcomes to foster care, right? I mean, this study is not a study of the impact of foster care yet. I'm going to talk about the benefits of extended care in a moment. But I, I don't want anyone to come away from here saying, uh, yeah, I heard this guy from the University of Chicago, used to be at Wisconsin, and he's saying how foster care caused all these bad outcomes. No, I'm not. I'm describing a young group of people making the transition. They're doing poorly relative to their peers, and I never met any, any agency manager or politician would say, I'm happy with those outcomes. We're okay with those outcomes. But, so they're poor, worse for young men. Um, despite this sobering picture, a lot of these young people are doing well. In fact, if I had a longer time, I have a whole uh, discussion that the practice world likes about the subgroups of these young people. And I would actually say about half of them are doing fine. They're, they've had to make the transition quickly, but they all have high school diplomas, a lot of them in college, you know, they, they've avoided trouble with the law. And then there's another half, most of whom are young parents who had kids early who are really struggling. They don't have a high school diploma, they're relying on public assistance, et cetera. And then a group, mainly young men, who have serious behavioral and emotional problems, uh, don't have work experience, uh, basically are in jail. So it, 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 looking at averages is misleading. But the other thing that's, that's a big difference is policy matters. I've given you outcomes across all three states. I did that deliberately. Um, if I were to break out Illinois versus the other two states, it would look very different across a range of outcomes. And the reason for that is that we had what us policy wonks like to call a uh, natural experiment. The ability of foster youth to remain in care, and by that I mean the state or the government having responsibility providing their care and supervision after the age of 18 very significantly across states in this country and vary between these three states when I did this study. Illinois had for many years at the time we started this study for reasons I won't get into here routinely provided care and supervision past the age of 18 all the way to the age of 21 but Iowa and Wisconsin did not. A uh, couple of exceptions uh, Iowa, if you're going to finish your high school diploma, and everybody said that's for sure going to happen, you could stay in care a little after your 19th birthday in Wisconsin. If you were pregnant, the reason for that was to protect the life of the unborn child. We actually had no one in Wisconsin in our study stay after 18. So this shows you the impact of this difference in policy. 
The yellow and magenta, wherever those are, purple columns, show when Wisconsin and Iowa youth left. Basically, they had all left by before 19 or in a couple of cases after 19 in Iowa. But if you look at Illinois, over half the young people I started with back in 17, exactly the same sampling criteria as in Iowa and Wisconsin, were still in care on their 21st birthday. And the net difference is that basically young people in Illinois on average, we're in care two years longer than in Iowa and Wisconsin. So as natural experiments go, this is a great one. Huge difference in the access to continuing support. So what do we find? Uh, and I'm summarizing a whole bunch of different studies here, the findings across a number of different studies using the best methods we have, uh, that these overall outcomes really obscure important differences. So allowing foster youth to remain in care until 21 is associated with a significant difference in the likelihood of post-secondary education, about a doubling of the likelihood that young people will have at least one year of college, and that's a big deal, actually, to have, have a year of college versus somebody who doesn't. I'll talk about the economic benefits of that in a moment. Uh, increased earnings, we've actually looked at that all the way out to age 26, and while initially in Illinois the young people are less likely to work, they're in college, and when you get out to 26, they're earning significantly more, about 20% more uh, on average than the other folks. Uh, reduction in pregnancies between 17 and 19 of about uh, 40 percent. Uh, increased involvement of young fathers with their children. Remember I talked about the fathers not being involved with their kids. Well, the young men who remained in care, uh, you know, controlling for everything else, were much more likely to be involved with their children than those who didn't. Reduced crime among females and then delayed homelessness. We don't prevent it altogether. So a fair number of young people who after the age of 21 in Illinois will have an episode of homelessness, but much less of it and much later in the life course. We also find that allowing young people to remain in care after 18 is associated with much greater receipt of all kinds of services. And the questions we asked were, that were about services that are required by federal law. Well, we required. I mean, the state of Illinois, all these states are getting money under something called the Chafee Program to provide independent living, transitional living services. If you stayed in care in Illinois, you're much more likely to get those services than if you were in Iowa or Wisconsin. So consistent with the desire to provide continuing support, remaining in care isn't just associated with you got a room to live in and you know, three square meals a day. You get all kinds of other help with employment, education, mental health, et cetera. So we did a benefit cost analysis, um, relying exclusively on that difference I pointed out in post-secondary educational attainment. And we look at lifetime earnings associated with having more education. We all know that, that more education, particularly higher education, is associated with earnings. And we find that uh, every dollar invested in extended care is associated with about $2 in increased earnings over the life course. And that benefit likely significantly understates the benefit cost ratio. And the reason for that is all those other good things I talked about, delayed pregnancy, uh, you know, reduced homelessness, et cetera, we don't have monetized estimates for that. Economists haven't given us data for that, but those are all positive things. So that benefit cost ratio is, is almost certainly higher than that. So in, in conclusion, uh, just to, to remind people, if you're not aware of it, of the policy context, um, this new law, the Fostering Connections to Success Act of 2008, which was influenced by this study, by the way. Uh, I presented testimony to the House Ways and Means Subcommittee when this was being debated, and um, the staff there tell me it was instrumental, the findings of study that your state participated in was instrumental in informing this part of the law. The law uh, extends Title IV-E, so that's the foster care funding mechanism, it's an entitlement program, um, including guardianship and adoption subsidies, so actually you can continue to receive those subsidies to 21, at state option, come back to that in a minute, uh, to age 21, I think in a very developmentally appropriate way. So young people to remain in care have to either be working, getting job training, in education, or they have to have a medical condition that prevents them from doing that, and the states are supposed to work with them in order to try to help them, even with that medical condition, get into uh, work or school. Uh, the law also keeps this, this Chafee program uh, that has $140 million. By the way, the earlier study in Wisconsin back in the mid-90s was the only study we had nationally when this was debated. It doubled the amount of money back in 1999 from $70 million to $140 million. So Wisconsin gets a lot of credit uh, for change in federal policy. Um, the state option implies great interstate variability. So we have 18 states so far 
that have federally approved plans, last time I looked, to extend foster care to 21. We have a lot of states that say they provide services past 18, um, but you know, sort of being on the hook to continue to provide care and supervision is fundamentally different than saying we provide services after 18. And we f these two states, Iowa and Wisconsin, provided services after 18 when I did the study. Youth just didn't get much uh, because the state and counties were not responsible for the care and supervision of those young people. So we have very big uh, variability between states. And uh, Wisconsin is one of the states that, with the exception of that um, one group that was mentioned, if you have an IEP, and you're in school, you can continue, uh, basically does not extend care and supervision after the age of 18. Uh, some, this is changing quickly since the law passed California, so it's the largest population in the country, has in fact extended foster care to 21. I'm in the midst of a study of that right now. I guess the one thing I would say about that, since I have a minute left, is uh, providing care and supervision. Any of you who are parents of young adult children know what I'm saying right now to be true. Uh, parenting a young adult is very different than parenting a minor. Um, they are adults. They're going to do what they want to do. Um, and they have the right to do what they want to do, actually. Their relationship with the juvenile court, or the court, which still supervises cases in many of these states, is fundamentally different. The living arrangements they're going to be in, they want to live in their own place, or they want to live with friends. They're not all going to continue to live in a foster home. Uh, so the states that have done this uh, have, have been in for a rude awakening in terms of uh, what it means. But I think it's, it's also pretty exciting. Uh, for those of us who are parents of, of uh, young adult children, we know that that's a very exciting period, one uh, full of opportunity, but also a lot of challenges. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to the next person. That <laughs>